Hey guys, we're in module A, week three, and we're going to be doing shearing of bolts and shearing in two different ways. You guys are going to be shearing bolts and actually direct shear, single shear. We're also going to look at the shear of threads on these fasteners. So let's talk about fasteners real quick, do a quick understanding of what the description of a fastener is. You guys are going to be working with the UN, the SAE designations for fasteners, versus the metric. But we have the English system here, basically. We're going to have something called a 3 8 So if you see 3 8 that is the nominal dimension from here to here. You're not going to hold that to a tolerance. It's just the nominal. It's thereabout. Okay, so we're going to have 3 8 16 is the number of threads per inch. So we're going to lay a ruler up here for one inch and count the repeating teeth and there should be 16 on that. That's going to be a unit UNC. That's a unified national course thread. If I had a fine thread it would have a lot more teeth per inch than 16. So here's a UNF thread right here and here's a UNC thread right here. You can see there are not very many threads here compared to this. There's a lot more threads. And this is where we're measuring that TPI, threads per inch. We're counting this. So one, two, three, four, five, and six threads per inch right here. Okay, that's common on a one inch thread. So we have UNC and UNF threads. They're going to have different properties. Now this is what we see most of our threads being is UNC. We could get gauges and we can measure that and it would tell us what the pitch would be if it went into those threads there. Now most of our threads real quick are right hand threads. If you put your hand down on it, the thumb points this way. That's the way the threads are going to go. Typically we only see left hand threads used in things like petroleum gas industry. So we don't accidentally put an air fitting onto that. So the left hand threads will be used or something for a mechanical advantage like a saw blade, the nut on that because centrifugal force would unscrew it. They would put the other thread where it keeps it tight. Now let's look at some stuff here. A nut typically has so many threads per inch and that's going to give us our maximum strength of that fastener. So on a coarse thread, it's usually three to four. On a fine thread, it's usually seven to eight. We're going to talk more of that here in a minute. Let's talk about pitch. Pitch is the repeating distance from here to here. The next feature that's repeating, that's our pitch. So metric fasteners measure pitch instead of TPI. TPI is how many threads repeating for one unit. Here's our major diameter that we can check that. And we're dealing with 60 degree threads included angle. Now, one quick offset that I would like to do is because you don't get this in any other classes just to talk about the machinery's handbook. This is really cool. If I had this machinery's handbook, it can tell me what size fastener I'm going to use and what kind of wrench I'm going to have. So if I had a quarter inch fastener, it's telling me right here to get across the flats, I need a 7 16 wrench. Okay, there's distance across the corner, and here's the typical thickness of the nut. If I go look for wrenches, let's say you're working for Ford and they want to design a special wrench. If you know that wrench opening, so we talked about 7 16 which is right here. Here is the minimum and maximum tolerance I would put on this so that it would comply with every nut and bolt that is made out there. So they have standards out there for this kind of stuff. The other thing that they have in this book is, is how close can I put one faster to the next to be serviceable? Now they have charts for different kinds of tools. This is an open end wrench. They have ta tables out there for box end wrenches, and that would let us get it even closer to this. But it lets me know how close can I put this and not hit this wall with the wrench and still be able to take this thing apart and put it together. So that might help in sizing this flange, not just from pressures, but also for serviceability. So if I'm looking at my wrench opening down here, I could go down and find where I'm at and get those dimensions off of this table. Now let's get back off onto track here with our shear testing at hand. And we're going to be giving you guys a series of bolts. And we're going to work with the SAE bolt designation because we're going to have bolts that conform to that. And you're going to have a bolt with no markings, one with three, and one with six. This is out of the machinery's handbook. And if I look at this, no markings means that we have a grade two. This is the yield. So 36 to 57 on the yield strength. Here's the Rockwell hardness of the core. So we, we're going to be doing that in lab. You guys have a little video on hardness testing, how to use a machine. 
we're going to go ahead and start right away when you have this bolt. Go ahead and start with the B scale. You don't have a lot of territory there to take your measurements and find out if you need to, but trust me, we can live with the B scale here. That's a grade two. If we go to three markings, that's a grade five right here. It's Look at the strength difference in this. 92 to 81 versus this 36, you know, almost double the yield strength, way up there. We have the UTS values also for these. Look at the hardness, really kicked it up there. If you were to look at these B scales to a C scale, that'd probably be about a four or five on the C scale to get you a feel of how that jumps up there. This is medium hardness. It's getting, you know, 60 on the C scale is really hard. So over here, you got faster with six lines. That's a, a grade eight, the number eight. Look at the strength of that 130 KSI on the yield little bit harder so what we're seeing is a huge difference between these two a little bit of a difference between these two this is going to be your strong fastener this is going to be your weak fastener if i was making something for sheer let's say i had a gearbox on a uh, an auger and i didn't want to hurt the gearbox i could put a bolt in there and typically they'll put like a grade two bolt in there at a certain diameter and they know that it will shear protecting that gearbox okay let's talk about the sheer yield strength now, we looked earlier on the previous slide and we saw how we could find the yield strength in tinsel, but what we're going to use here is the distortion energy theorem, which basically deals with the change in shape of the system, and that's going to be 57.7% of that tinsel yield strength. So we're going to look up the yield strength, multiply it times 57.7%, so that's 0.557, we're going to multiply and get our shield, shear yield strength. When we look at the stress strain, stress strain diagram, there's some interesting points that we want to see here. First is this linear region. That's where the Hooke's Law, Young's Modulus is going to apply. That's where we can see the elastic range. That's where we design our fasteners to operate below the yield point. And in that zone, we know that the change in stress here, PSI, is going to be over the change of strain here. And that's going to give us a slope of that. So more stronger, stiffer fasteners made out of steel versus aluminum, different slopes on there. What we need to do in our calculations to calculate strength properties is we're going to need to know the shear modulus. Okay, now to get that, we're going to use this equation right here. So we're going to need to know our Young's modulus right here, and then we're going to need to know Poisson's ratio. If you remember, Poisson's ratio is the ratio of axial and lateral strains, and so strain is the change in length over the original length, correct? So we're going to take the change in the lengths and the change in the diameters, and we're going to compare those together and come out with Poisson's ratio, which is typically around 0.2 to 0.5. We're going to rewrite that equation to look like this. We can solve for G. So if we could look these up in a table, we're solid on getting our module sub elasticity and shear. Now, when we do our fasteners, UTS, we're definitely seeing failure here, but we also see failure past the yield stress. So let's look at this properties of 4140 here. This is annealed properties coming from MatWeb. So typical things we might see in there are our Rockwell hardnesses. We're going to see our UTS. We're going to see our yield. And we're going to see things like modulus elasticity here. Here's our Poisson ratio right here, 0.29. So I could solve for G knowing these two entities right here, modulus elasticity, that, but guess what? They gave, they were nice on this metal. Not always do we get the shear modules, but you can see it is less than the modulus elasticity. Okay, so they, they're giving it to us there. That's nice, but no shear strength. We're going to have to do the distortion theory to that yield. Now, this is a lot like what you guys are going to do in the lab. We're going to do single shear on a fastener. Now, I like this picture right here because it shows that we have a bolt with a shoulder. Again, standard bolts have a typical shoulder length to thread ratio versus the diameters. So if your length of your bolt is from the end of the bolt to where it hits just right under the hex here. So if I look at this, my shear plane on this from this plate, this plate going opposite direction is going to go right through that shoulder. That's what we want. So you guys are going to be doing some cutting on bolts on the saws, and then we're going to um, put those bolts in single shear, and we're going to test it. Now our fixture is really strong and robust, and so we're not going to have any distortion in the fixture. Okay, That's a tool steel that we made that out of, and it's great for doing these kind of tests. The thing we don't want to do is have the shoulder 
out of that shear plane and put the shear plane directly on to the threaded portion. That's a recipe for disaster in a shear loaded situation. So what's shear? Golly, shear, uh, look at this bolt here. We, we, we loaded it one direction, the other we stopped some point and it never really broke all the way through. What did we do? We went past the yield and we strain hardened it. Now, in material science, you're going to talk about things like body-centered cubic or crystal and structure metal, and that is true. We're going to have these structures, and we can dislocate them, and up to a certain point, we can make them stronger because for the energy to go through there, it's going to take more energy. So once we see that, we're not actually breaking this. This isn't actually broke. This is strain hardened locally in this area. But what we've done is changed the crystalline structure up such that it's offset here to look like this. Now, anytime we shear something, if I go to a metal shear or even shearing our bolts, we're going to get the same kind of characteristics of a sheared edge here. And so we're going to be able to look at these under the microscope and you guys are going to be able to observe the fracture of your fasteners here. Now, when we shear over a surface, there's going to be some rollover initially. There's going to be a burnish. This is our shearing action here. And then we're going to fracture that material here in this zone, which is basically where we're going to fracture it. And then, which is right here. Okay, so here's our rollover portion here. Here's our burnish. We're going to see some shearing lines happening there. Our fracture is going to be kind of grainy and looking down here. And then we're going to have a burr. Probably should have flipped this image around. This looks like the burnished area and this is our fractured area on this with the burr on the back side so orientate your samples where you can see them right when you take images you'll get a lot better images than I have here one of the things I want you guys to do is don't oh hey let's talk about something real quick burnish versus fractured the strength of the bolt pay attention to where this line is did it get bigger or smaller in these zones right here for the strong versus the weak bolt that's a cool thing to observe the other thing is, don't get headstrong if you guys design stuff that you're just going to look at the shear of the fastener. You're also going to have in your strengths course and machine elements more studies on stress concentration. So if I drop a hole into a part that I'm going to put a bolt, will this be strong enough out here or will I pull a tinsel on this and it breaks? Or am I going to pull that fastener because it was too close to this edge and just pull it right out of there? And that's stress concentration. So that's another cool topic. Now, we said you guys are going to do single shear. So you're doing single shear here. You're going to be pulling this direction and pulling this direction. We have really good, strong fixtures that aren't going to distort. But normally, if I did that and I put a force here and here, I would actually see, because of the stress flow, that those thin pieces of metal, if they were fairly thin and weak, would actually distort and warp. Still going to shear that fastener in there, but I am going to see some a little bit of different loadings in there. Ours is going to be in direct shear, and our fasteners are not going to deflect. All right, so tau is our shear stress, force over area, simple equation. Take our force, we're 100% on that single, uh, single shear zone, the area of the circle, pi times diameter squared over four. This is our stress. If I go to double shear, look at here, I've got a shear plane here on this shoulder and another one. That is going to basically decrease my load to half because I've got two shear zones here. So half the load. I'm going to decrease the stress in half. That's huge. So it's double shear going to be a lot stronger than single shear. Now, bolts like to have a certain amount of engagement before they get the strength of that fastener. Now, this one's not in shear. This one's trying to pull apart. And what we're doing is looking at in lab, we're going to give you guys some bolts and some nuts, and we're going to know based off of the pitch how much we need to turn in revolutions so that we can measure the displacement vertically, how much it goes in and how much it goes into that nut to get one revolution. So you're going to have to figure that out from threads per inch to displacement to get one full revolution of engagement. Then you're going to do another fastener at two, three, four, and on. And what we're going to do is put those in a machine and we're going to shear the threads. Look at this thread. This was only done basically at two threads and look at the shear across those threads. So we didn't get the full strength of the fastener. Um, the machine will stop when it shears the threads and we'll log that entry. We'll be helping out that in lab. But a coarse thread typically takes three to four threads. And what I would do down here is say this is actually seven to eight on a fine thread. Some places it'll say five to six, but seven and eight is typically on a fine thread. 
So when we look at the, the thread load distribution here on a standard 60 degree thread, the majority of the load is going to be carried by that first thread. So even if I had all these engaged, we're going to see the first thread carrying about 34% and then reductions all the way down to about the fourth thread there. The rest of the threads really aren't going to carry that much. So we could kind of look at a stress plot and see that happening in there. So the majority of the load, again, carried by the first three threads, majority 34% by that first thread in a standard 60 degree setup. Now, the reason we want to look at that is because when you guys do that, you're going to see that progression of the strength of the threads in our experiment. There is a cool new fastener that's out there that we use for a variety of things. One is vibration. This won't need thread washer lock washers. It won't need thread lock tight, stuff like that. We can tighten it up. And basically what they're doing is using a standard fastener. They use a different tap for the female portion, and it's going to have this ramp type profile. This is called spiral lock, and they've kind of got a patented market on this. You actually have to have two gauges to check the, the thread out because you got to check this portion of the thread as well as the 60 degree included. So a little more expensive on the tooling because you're going to buy premium taps and gauges to, to check and make these parts. But what do we like seeing this? Guys, I see it working with Caterpillar and John Deere, Ditch Witch. All these companies are using these things for a lot of their critical um connections that are fasteners for vibratory areas, vibratory plows, things like that. What we're seeing is we've got standard here and we've got spiral lock here. What are we saying? Look at the standard stress distributions. Again, 34% and then it downgrades. Look at this. The load is shared all the way down through the different threads that we engage. So the stress is going to be lower. This is going to make a stronger, better connection. We can see the difference in the stress plots here. The thing I want to point out is this is also going to be great for vibration. Yes, you can take this fastener out and put right back in there. So things you may want to look at are other cool things that you're going to see out in the industry. Now, at this point, we've talked about shear, uh, direct shear, where we're going to shear a fastener and single shear. And we've talked about shear in the fasteners. You need to go out and make sure you watch that video on Rockwell testing so you know how to use a Rockwell tester because we're going to test the strength or the hardness of those bolts. And then the other thing is you want to uh, watch the lab prep on using the equipment and be prepared for lab.